So all over the world today, Christians of various denominations are celebrating Holy Communion. Many of them are reading from what's called the Revised Common Lectionary, which is the recommended list of uh, readings for worship. Some not insignificant number are all going to be reading our text for today because it is one of the recommended texts. So this is 2 Timothy, <clears throat> first chapter. I'm going to read the verse, for verses 1 to 7 first, and then we'll come back to the rest a little later. Listen, friends, for the word of God as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the author of 2 Timothy. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. This is the word of God for the people of God. So, World Communion Sunday is a tradition that began at a Presbyterian church in Pennsylvania back in 1933. Seven years later, as the Second World War began to engulf nations around the world, it was adopted by most of the mainline Christian denominations so that in the context of World War II, World Communion Sunday became an important annual reminder of Christians' unity in Christ. Across the United States and around the world, there is truly an astounding variety of Christian denominations practicing diversity of worship and uh, like worship style and practice, um, diversity of building architecture and cultural influences, uh, diversity of organization and administration, but also more significantly, of course, different denominations of Christianity um, vary in their interpretation of Christian theology. Some of these differences are subtle. Uh, some of them are actually quite significant. There are also differences among us in our understanding and interpretation of the Bible, as well as differences in the way that we live out our faith. Every follower of Jesus must find a church home uh, that best fits who they are in Christ in terms of theology and biblical interpretation and community style and worship preferences. Uh, we've all chosen to be part of the family of faith here at Christ United Methodist Church for very important reasons, after all. For each of us, we have decided that, that this is the place where we can best grow in the faith. We have made this our spiritual home, one that, that nurtures our own journeys with God. And yet, uh, despite the incredible diversity of Christian denominations worldwide, we all share a common faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In Him, we, uh, we are part of one global body of Christ, World Communion Sunday is a day set aside each year to remind us uh, that we are united by our faith in Him. In a, in a divisive and divided world, opportunities to find common ground are truly blessings in this or any troubled age. That unity is an important theme, especially, I think, for this season in our own denomination, the United Methodist Church, uh, and I'll I'll come back to that point shortly. Our scripture reading today comes from a collection of writings known as the Pastoral Epistles. They include uh, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. And although we cannot know for sure, uh, roughly 80 to 90% of scholars believe that the Pastoral Epistles were written in Paul's name by a later theologian uh, in order to extend Paul's thought to a new generation in the church. This was common practice in the ancient world. It occurs a few places in scripture. Second Timothy is written in the style of a, of a final testament from a mentor, Paul, to his mentee, Timothy. And it's intended to encourage a young church leader uh, during a difficult, tumultuous time in the church because uh, in those earliest decades of the church's history, there were significant differences of opinion within the church about certain aspects of theology 
and practice, uh, which of course you could say about any period of church history. Because it turns out that people in general, and perhaps church people in particular, tend to have passionately held opinions about a wide range of subjects. Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) I have the emails to prove it. I have the receipts, as the kids are saying these days. And since there are some things that uh, we simply cannot know with certainty until we get to heaven and get to ask Jesus for ourselves, that means that our uh, imperfect, incomplete understanding um, leads us to disagree on some things. Sometimes we disagree on uh, even big things. And so 2 Timothy, whether it was written by Paul or a later student of Paul in his name, is intended to be a word of encouragement to a young pastor trying his best to lead a bunch of opinionated people who don't all agree. So that means that it's a good word for all of us who spend our lives in the church. Because uh, at its best, I believe, the church is a family of believers who can agree on the essentials while agreeing to disagree on other issues. Challenging, learning from, and encouraging each other along the way. All right, let's finish our uh, reading. Verses 8 to 14 of that first chapter. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Amen. Today we remind ourselves that we are one in spirit with all Christians around the world in the global body of Christ. Despite our differences, uh, we share the same sacred texts, we share common interests, we share faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. World Communion Sunday is an important annual reminder of that truth. I think this year, World Communion Sunday also gives us a chance to reflect on what unites us as the United Methodist Church. Uh, What is it that, that brings us together? What is it that holds us together? What is it that keeps us together? What, what makes us us. Now our scripture for today, written to encourage a young pastor in turbulent times, gives us some important highlights. Hang in there, Paul writes, or someone writing in Paul's name. God has called you according to his own purpose and grace, and it's all about grace, Paul writes. Grace in this life and in the life to come. And you, Paul writes, not just to Timothy, But to each one of us who claims Christ as our own, your job is to be a herald and an apostle and a teacher. Which is to say, our job is to share this good news with the world, this grace given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Whether we've been here five minutes or 50 years or somewhere in the middle, all of us are part of God's purpose for the world, which, in the words of the mission of the United Methodist Church, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our, our job. That's our mission. Or, in the specific language of Christ United Methodist Church, uh, we're called to love God and serve others and transform lives. And there's this phrase from Second Timothy, this first chapter of Second Timothy that I love. And I quote it often, and it's one of those, in my opinion, that's worth committing to memory, uh, especially when we're looking to, to put our feet on solid ground. I know the one in whom I have put my trust. I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I want to be, 
I wanna be part of his mission, and I wanna be part of his ministry, and I wanna do my part to share his gospel, his good news with the world. I chose long ago the United Methodist Church as my spiritual home. I long ago heard a call to ordain ministry in the United Methodist Church, and this is where I plan to stay. Now, you may know that this is a challenging time for our denomination. Uh, you may have seen in the news or heard from friends or gotten an email from somebody um, about churches who are choosing to quote unquote disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. And I'm using air quotes because uh, that is the technical term from our book of discipline. These churches are choosing to disaffiliate over issues related to human sexuality. And it is certainly true that this can be a difficult subject. In a church our size, there is a difference of theological opinion when it comes to the subject of human sexuality. That probably doesn't surprise you. If you've talked to more than one person <laughs> in the congregation, you probably know we have a diversity of opinion. In any meeting in our church, in any Bible study in our church, as I look out on the group of people gathered here for worship this morning, we are United Methodists who are very conservative and uh, very liberal and everything in between. And this is not unique to us. This has been true of all four of the United Methodist congregations that I've served. Of course, we have disagreements uh, about more than just human sexuality. Uh, this is also true for subjects like immigration policy, gun laws, abortion, racism. It's our Advent sermon series, by the way, on those four things. No. <laughs> That'd be lively. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> but on all of these subjects and more, we are United Methodists who are very conservative and very liberal and, and everything in between. And I believe that two things are true uh, when it comes to our differences of opinion. The first thing I believe is that we're better for our diversity. I do not want to surround myself only with people who agree with me. <laughs> that would be easier, for sure, but it would be boring. And it would also not be good for my intellectual or spiritual health. Second, uh, these subjects are not the essentials when it comes to our shared theology. Our individual beliefs on these subjects are not what make us United Methodists, which means that they should not be allowed to divide, we should not allow them to divide us. What makes us United Methodists is our doctrine, those core beliefs of our Wesleyan understanding of the Christian faith. And in the United Methodist Church, uh, those doctrines are found in the Articles of Religion and the Confession of Faith and the General Rules. Our doctrine includes our belief in the Trinity, for example, our belief in the divinity and resurrection of Christ, the salvation that God offers the world through Christ, our uniquely Wesleyan concepts of grace, our emphasis on continuing to grow in love for God and neighbor throughout our lives, that's uh, sanctification, the practical living out of our faith in action, which is the way that we partner with God in the transformation of the world. These are the things that make us Wesleyan. Uh, our doctrine as United Methodists then is lived out in our mission and in our ministry. And this is really important to say. In the midst of a difficult season for our United Methodist Church, our doctrine, our mission, and our ministry are not in question. Everything else, whether it's our position on social issues, and we have lots of those, or our internal policies, everything else is secondary. And about everything else we can passionately agree and boy, do we. About everything else, we do not have to have unanimity of thought. We do not require that. Quite the opposite. As I said, we're better for our diversity. So at our town hall meeting, after this worship service, um, we've got a lot of things to cover, but one of the things we're gonna be talking about is that we have no plans to leave the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> Neither I, nor our other clergy, nor our senior lay leadership want to leave our spiritual home. That does not mean we all agree. <laughs> we agree not that we don't want to leave, 
But on the subject itself, there's disagreement among us. But we've, we've all chosen this place for a reason. Christ United Methodist Church was founded almost 50 years ago on the, on the doctrine and the mission and the ministry of the United Methodist Church. And in the half century since, thousands upon thousands of United Methodists have poured themselves into making this place what it is. Our holy calling as stewards of, of this place is to continue to build upon what's been handed down to us. And that's what we intend to do. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've served on the Board of Ordained Ministry for our North Texas Annual Conference, which is our regional area. Um, I was vice chair for four years. I've spent the past two years as chair. I have two more to go, and I'm counting down the days till I'm not chairing that board anymore. <laughs> it's holy work, but holy cow, is it work? And um, <laughs> that's the board that's responsible for evaluating candidates for ordained ministry in three separate areas. Uh, my entire tenure, for 10 years now, I have been focused on United Methodist theology and doctrine. And there's a, there's a broad range of what United Methodists believe when it comes to uh, interpretations of this or that aspect of our theology. And one of the things that we require candidates to know is that there are five doctrinal standards for United Methodists. Um, the ones that I mentioned before, the Articles of Religion, the Confession of Faith, and the General Rules. Those are all very clear. It's a common pejorative thing. Some people say that Methodists don't believe anything, and that's quite opposite. It's true. We believe a whole lot. It's articulated in the discipline. But in addition to those, those three things, um, we also include the sermons of Wesley and his New Testament commentary. It's a copy on my desk if you ever want to go look at it. And then a famous sermon called Catholic spirit, and all that means, that's the churchy word for universal spirit, so universal spirit. Wesley argued that if we are clear about the essentials of our faith, then when it comes to everything else, Methodists should think and let think. And the thing to remember about this is that Wesley, his context was a long history in England of religious warfare and bloodshed where people literally killed themselves, each other over differences of opinion, and Wesley was adamant that that not be the case in the Methodist Church. As long as we are clear on the doctrines, we should offer each other grace on our opinions. It's a beautiful thing about being Methodist. And here's what Wesley wrote. To be ignorant of many things and to mistake in some is the necessary condition of humanity. <laughs> We are broken and imperfect creatures. We don't know it all. We won't know it all till we get to heaven and can ask Jesus for ourselves. And he goes on, I do not mean be of my opinion. You need not. I do not expect nor desire it. Which is saying something because if you know Wesley, he was pretty opinionated. Neither do I mean I will be of your opinion. Keep you your opinion and I mine and that as steadily as ever. Only give me thine hand, because <laughs> we're in this together. Friends, like you, I, I know the one in whom I have put my trust. And like you, I am clear that I've found a spiritual home here. Thanks be to God through the power of the Holy Spirit for keeping us united. <laughs> Amen.